And once again, welcome to the LA Burgers webinar for May 17th. And tonight we are very happy to have Scott Pipkin with us. But before we get to that, if you're not a member yet of LA Burgers, please consider becoming a member. We need your support and uh, it your uh, membership gets you first dibs on education classes and field trips and and also it gives you a nice warm and fuzzy feeling that you're helping support uh, something like Ellie Burgers. So please go to our website and and join us. And with that, I would like to introduce Susan again to introduce our speaker for tonight, Susan. Okay, thanks, Ron. Um, Scott Pipkin is certainly no stranger to many of us. From 2012 to 2016, Scott served as the public access manager for Tejon Ranch Conservancy leading birding, wildflower, and natural history tours through the San Joaquin Valley, the Antelope Valley, and the Tehachapi Mountains. Today, Scott is the Director of Education and Engagement at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Scott is a native California. Maybe that's why he loved California native plants so much. Scott was born and raised in San Diego and received his degree in geography with an emphasis on biogeography from UCLA. Scott has spent his career acquiring and sharing an understanding of the natural world that emphasizes the interconnections that surround us. These efforts have allowed him to work in some of the most beautiful and ecologically rich places in the Southwest, including Tejon Ranch, Yosemite, the redwoods of the San Mateo Coast, Saguaro National Park in Arizona, and the Lincoln National Forest in New Mexico. Along the way, Scott received a second degree in landscape architecture from the University of Arizona. Scott has spent countless hours identifying plants, birds, butterflies, reptiles, and anything else that's come his way. And it's our great pleasure and privilege to have him with us tonight. So without further ado, play, please welcome Scott Pipkin. Oh, thank you for that introduction. It's really nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I think I'll just get, get right into it. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about native plants for birds. Um, I am Scott and I work at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and I love plants and I love birds. And in the lower left there, you see a gray cat bird that we had in the garden a couple falls ago. It was attracted to the desiccated grapes, the little raisins that were still persisting on the vine. So the, the plants bring the birds, there's the evidence, but um, I will provide more evidence. So let's see if I can move through here. There we go. Um, so here's what's ahead. Um, probably talked about me more than enough, but I'll talk a little bit more about myself. Then we'll talk about the garden. Then we'll talk a little bit about just this concept of native plants for birds. We'll get into some design. Uh, I do have a background in landscape architecture and design, so we'll talk about actually creating uh, your bird oasis. And then um, we will finish off with some great native plants for birds. Uh, so as Susan said, I'm from San Diego. I went to UCLA where I graduated with a degree in biological geography and ecology. Uh, after that, I worked as an environmental educator, I worked in a Montessori school for a little bit. I did a little bit of field work for the National Park Service. Uh, then I enrolled in uh, graduate school, studied landscape architecture, uh, got a really interesting position working on the Lincoln National Forest. Then I went to Tejon. After Tejon, I moved to back to New Mexico uh, to do education for Audubon, New Mexico. And then we had this opportunity to move here back to California, back to my roots and uh, really happy to be here because the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is an incredible place. Um, the, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is the first botanic garden in the country dedicated to native plants. So we've long been a leader in understanding the impact that native plants have on landscapes. And um, there are about 6,500 different kinds of native plants in California. Um, our garden displays about a sixth of the state's plant flora, which, which is actually pretty good when you consider um, the geographic diversity of California. Um, and we 
have this really interesting kind of nexus of horticulture, conservation science. We have a conservation team with eight PhDs who do work ranging from um, doing genetic analysis of island fox scat to better understand the insects that the foxes rely on, to better understand the plants that the insects rely on, and sort of reconstructing um, ecosystem food webs, um, network ecology type stuff, which is interesting, ranging all the way to systematics, um, identifying species, finding new species, writing floras, and then all the way to uh, arranging community science projects, looking at fire recovery in places like the Thomas Fire Scar, uh, and then education. So um, we sort of inhabit this really rich area where horticulture, conservation, and education all intersect. And it's, it's really exciting for me to be a part of that. So um, I think you all know why birds, but um, this relationship between plants and birds. So um, just to get our minds thinking about birds, not just from um, the standpoint of bird identification, but from the standpoint of bird structure and function and ecology, uh, I want to do an activity that I call a 30 second art class. So if everybody can get out um, a piece of paper and something to write with, I'm going to flash for 30 seconds the silhouette of a bird. And I would like you to try to sketch that silhouette in about 30 seconds. So here we go. So take about 30 seconds to sketch this silhouette. All right, take about five more seconds. So um, in, in that effort, uh, Woodhouse is scrub jay. Um, so this is a bird, New Mexico, uh, thanks to Tom Taylor from uh, the Sangre de Cristo Audubon chapter for providing this bird. Um, but when you were drawing the bird, you probably noticed a couple things about its structure. You may have keyed in on this nice, chunky bill, this nice generalist's bill, uh, which gives us an indication of what this bird eats. Um, a little bit of everything, but uh, anything ranging from acorns. Did you know that a scrub jay can cash like 5,000 acorns in, in a year? And it, it has a reasonable understanding of where all of them are. Uh, lizards, eggs, other, other materials, other food sources, or this long tail which uh, gives us a little sense of the structure of its habitat. Long-tailed bird, woodland bird, great for navigating in between spaces, tight, um, tight plant communities where things are very close together, lots of maneuverability. So when we're thinking about plants for birds, this is what we're responding to. We're responding to the, the needs of these birds in terms of their, their habitat, where they want to be flying, what they want to be feeding on, how they want to live. And this idea of designing gardens and utilizing native plants for birds is to support this life history that I think ties in so well with the, the practice of bird watching. I know personally, I find myself getting caught up in um, a lot of the listing when I'm when I'm out birding, you know, what's the next bird I'm going to see? And I find myself um, taking extra moments more and more to really think about how how is this bird interacting with the habitat? How is this place supporting this bird's survival? Uh, a game I've been playing a little bit with my you know, when I watch birds is what is it eating? What's the bird eating? Can we key into exactly what these birds are eating? Um, because that tells us a lot about the habitat requirements that they have. So when, when we're talking about habitat requirements, um, here are a few kind of principles that, that I think about when designing for birds. So having these layers of habitat 
is going to support the various guilds of birds. So, we, you know, our ground feeders, our gleaners in the foliage, our fly catchers who are utilizing the outward highest branches of, of a plant uh, to do their sallying feeding. Um, thinking about escape routes. So there's a, a great book out there, it was published, I don't know, about 10 years ago. It's called Field Notes on Science and Nature. And it's an edited volume uh, with a bunch of authors, scientists, artists, all talking about the importance of taking field notes. And one of the contributors who's an artist made some comment about value. Um, you know, the, the, the darkest darks and the lightest lights and everything in between. And it really changed my perspective to, to try to put myself in the position of an animal that is reading a landscape, that's seeing a landscape and almost seeing it like an artist and seeing the value. So in that central picture there, try to locate where's the darkest dark you can find. Chances are, if there was a bird on the ground in front of you and you startled it, that's where it would fly, right? It's going to fly to that deep dark area where it knows it's going to be hidden in shadow. And so thinking about designing to have, have these edges, we know the edge is important for feeding and other life history processes. Um, and then this idea of the interplay of the light and the shadow and that by creating shadow uh, adjacent to a feature like a water dish, is going to greatly increase a bird's comfort and desire to utilize that resource because they know they have a reasonable escape route. And we haven't just created a slip for a Cooper's hawk or a pygmy owl to pick off birds from our water source because they have nowhere to escape to. And then this idea of, of roosting and perching, like where are these birds hanging out? Where are they resting? Um, so, you know, thinking about, do you already have mature canopy um, is that something that maybe you should keep some of that or think about designing successionally um, so you have time to create new canopy because, you know, canopy is one of the hardest things to come by from a gardening standpoint. It takes so many years to create that canopy. That's, that's one of the biggest investments uh, we can make in the landscape. So um, sometimes when we think about bird behavior, we, we talk about like bird language. And this is sort of getting into the uh, wilderness awareness type type of way of reading the landscape. And, you know, bird language, the voices of the birds, right? The alarm calls versus the songs versus uh, the contact calls versus male aggression calls versus feeding calls, right? They're the voices. But bird language is also physical. Um, and by, by watching the way birds are behaving, uh, we can get some, some indication of what's going on around us, but we can also use it as a cue to think about how we are going to support bird behavior because there are these kind of, and you've noticed this, I'm sure as you're watching birds, there are these certain actions that birds will do when they're startled that become their um, go-to moves, so to speak, to get a better vantage of what's happening or to escape a potential threat. And if we have these in mind when we're designing, we can potentially support these behaviors that the, the birds have kind of um, hardwired into them. So here's an example, the bird plow, right? We've all seen this. You got a bunch of birds on the ground, you approach them and they all plow in, a, in sort of a shotgun fashion. So that's where this idea of the shadows comes in. That's where the idea of multiple layers of habitat comes in because they're going to want to escape to those various kind of nooks and crannies where they feel like they can turn back and look at the threat and also have a deeper escape route. Similarly, you've got the sentinel. I'm sure you've seen this where a bird on, a ground, on the ground or on a, a low uh, perch, you approach it and it does this sort of J shape and it flies up to a higher point so it can get that vantage point, be in a safe space and sort of um, get, get a sense of what's going on. Um, there's also the popcorn. So uh, a group of birds might be kind of popcorning together. Think about like a flock of bush tits or something like that. Um, how sometimes you've been walking down the trail and you're kind of pacing this group of birds, but they're in a, a dense hedge or something like that. And they're popcorning through. So these are all behaviors that can start to inform our design decisions when we're thinking about using plants for birds as, as a structure, as a habitat that the birds are going to utilize. So that's one of the, the key ways we can use plants for birds. 
Um, of course, you know, one of the things that makes birds so compelling is uh, their life history. And part of that is the process of nesting. So being able to provide a variety of nesting locations. So this, this goes back to an understanding of what birds do we expect in our yard? Uh, who are we supporting? And what do they need? What kinds of nests? So I think it's a, a really great opportunity for us to just dive a little bit deeper into the life histories of these birds and better understand what their habitat requirements are, what, what their nesting preferences, what media they use for nesting, what materials. So we're not only uh, thinking about plants as providing structure for the physical nest to be located, but also potentially thinking about what are the plants that are gonna provide nest materials for some of these birds that we want to attract to our yards. So now, you know, I've sort of talked generally about plants as supporting birds, but why native plants? Um, why, why, why not all exotic plants? You can create shadows with exotic plants. You can create layers of habitat. You can do a lot of these things with, with non-native plants, but native plants are extremely important. And this is because the link between native plants and insects is critical. So you see some of the, the information here, right? Like breathe in, you're in a relationship with a plant when you do that. And when you breathe out, we're, we're in relationship with plants and plants are providing the base level sugars that support all life and energy or most life and energy on earth. Terrestrially, um, I would say it's, it's just about all. Um, so these plants are, are the bottom of the pyramid of the sort of ecological energy pyramid, the trophic pyramid. And then just above the plants, above the primary producers, you have the primary consumers and largely these are insects. So half of the biodiversity on the planet is insects. And, you know, about a, a quarter to a third of them are herbivorous. A large proportion of those herbivorous insects have obligate host plants, whether it's as larvae or as adults. The classic example is monarch butterflies. If you don't have milkweed, you can't have monarchs. Lepidopterans in particular have these very tight relationships with plants. They've co-evolved to have larval host plants. And if they do not have that larval host plant, they cannot survive. They do not pupate. They do not become butterflies. They do not reproduce. They do not pollinate. And so the connection then with birds is that 96% of our songbirds feed their young a diet that consists 100% of arthropods. So even if they're frugivorous, even if they're granivorous throughout most of the year, during breeding season, a lot of, a lot of our terrestrial birds switch their diet preference and they're consuming more insects for reproduction. And they're also feeding a lot of insects to their young. And if you look at that, about half of the diet is lepidopterans. And these are largely caterpillars. And again, particularly with Lepidoptera, the caterpillars are obligate feeders on native plants. So the relationship between native plants and insects and birds is, is inextricable. And so utilizing native plants, not only for the structural kind of components that they provide, but also thinking them about them as these critical food sources is why I think it's so important for us to incorporate native plants in, in our habitat gardens. So now let's think about design. So hopefully I've, I've, you were probably, I hope already somewhat convinced that native plants are good, but hopefully now you have a little bit more reason to, to believe. Um, so let's think about how do we use these native plants? Because we're not, we're not doing restoration. We're not just letting things grow as they grow. We're gardening. We're, we're making conscious decisions. It's a beautiful thing. It's something that humans have always done is interact with their landscape and encourage some things to grow and maybe clean out some others and uh, have aesthetic preferences and have habitat preferences. And so I think this is just a, a beautiful way for us to engage with the natural world. And so three components of this are the planning stage, knowing what we want to do, the design stage, and then maintenance. 
So um, setting some goals, being realistic. What birds do you really expect to attract to your garden site? Um, you know, best of luck to you if you're trying to create a migrant trap, but that might be a lofty goal. So I would suggest you start with um, either whether you have your own personal records or go to eBird and look at hotspots adjacent to you, or if you have any personal hotspots, personal locations that, that you bird frequently in your sort of patch, what birds would you expect? What birds are you trying to support? Um, what's the seasonality of these birds? Uh, how much maintenance are you really interested in? How much are you going to be uh, maintaining the plants in the space? And then, you know, if you're a homeowner or, or you have the opportunity to, to do a home improvement project, how might this dovetail with other projects that, that you are considering, such as installing gray water, laundry to landscape? That's a perfect opportunity to adjacent to your gray water outlet, set up a mulch basin, put a bunch of willows. Um, willows are great habitat plants, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Um, so are there ways in and you know, drought is on the tip of everybody's tongue more and more um, these days. And we know that temperatures are getting hotter. So plants are experiencing higher evapotranspiration because most plants don't turn off photosynthesis. If the sun is shining, they are photosynthesizing. If they're photosynthesizing, they're losing a little bit of water through evapotranspiration. That water loss creates a pressure differential within the plant which then causes water to draw up from the root. So it's, it's tied inextricably to the mechanism of photosynthesis. But as conditions get hotter and hotter, evapotranspiration loads increase on the plants. So now when we talk about the opportunity to harvest our gray water, harvest rainwater, catch more water, keep that water on site, not only are we providing relief for our plants, but this is a great opportunity to really have some habitat outcomes associated with that water capture. So then also understanding what your site conditions are. Where are you in the world? What can you expect to grow? What are your sun and shade patterns? How do they change over the course of the year? What's the topography on your site? Uh, how do people move through the site? How are people going to be using it? Um, really kind of developing a, a good sense of what you are actually doing with, with your garden design, how it's going to function, because it, it may well be that all you want to do is create habitat. For a lot of folks, it's, I wanna create habitat. I wanna have indoor, outdoor living. I'd, I'd like a space where I can sit and relax while the kids play outside. I'd like a place where we can do outdoor dining, a uh, place where I can entertain. I want curb appeal. So all of these are, are outcomes, desired outcomes that can be associated with our design and they can all be quite compatible with bird habitat, but planning them carefully is an important component to that you know, future success. And then thinking about sort of design for the sake of design, I mean, you know, to some degree it, it's artistic and it's about expression, but there are also some practical design elements to consider. So, you know, with unity and variety, um, it's good to have diversity, but it's not as good to have one of everything. Um, so I'm going to give you a list of a bunch of plants today. If you were to just plant one of each of those plants, you may not end up with great habitat for the birds. The, the birds need some massing. Um, one toy on may not cut it. Three or four toy ons that are all laden with berries now that becomes an, an attraction for the birds. So how are we massing plants and really trying to create that enticing sort of design through our plant selection? We want diversity because we want a diversity of, of birds. We want a diversity of insects. We want a diversity of structures, um, but we don't want so much diversity that we kind of lose the opportunity to really make that attractive food source or habitat source. Um, scale and proportion, again, thinking about those layers, thinking about how your design is going to interact with any buildings that are in your area. Rhythm, you can see in that diagram that this idea of shadow, um, these rhythmic elements providing that, that kind of um, structural light and shadow that the birds so love. And I really encourage if you haven't keyed into when you scare a bird, watch where it goes. 
And I've found more and more they're going to the deepest shadow that they can find. Um, and that, that's really informed my, my ideas around sort of design for birds. Um, this idea of emphasis and balance, these are more aesthetic, um, but we can achieve some, some really beautiful designs alongside the, the habitat outcome. And then there's this idea of like givers of form. Um, so understanding where to put the plant and how to delineate your garden bed. So thinking about circulation, where are people walking around? Um, if you've got a, par a place where people park their car and they always step out of the car and they cut through the yard to get to the front door, probably not the best idea to, to put a bunch of plants there. If there's already this kind of existing desire line in your site that people are walking through, that may not be the most successful location for placing plants. So really thinking about your um, circulation, thinking about views uh, into your site, out of your site, borrowed scenery, borrowing habitat features from, from other yards or other gardens that may be in the area. Um, just thinking about what you like to do in your garden uh, or your whatever outdoor space you're planning is going to help you understand how your design is going to play out. And then just this question of maintenance, you know, um, as, as a gardener, the expectation is that you're to some degree caring for these plants, you're cultivating, you're tending them. Um, how much care do you have time for? Um, thinking about, you know, some of these plants that provide a lot of fruit, for instance, can be extremely messy, like that gander oak um, can just drop tons of acorns and leaves on the ground all the time. From my standpoint, that's great. That's, that's food, that's biomass, that's going to decompose and create soil. It's going to help, it's a natural mulch that helps maintain soil moisture levels, reduce uh, evaporation as the sun hits you know, bare dirt and uh, water evaporates out of the soil. So in my mind, those are all great things, but somebody may see a tree dropping a lot of its leaves and say, that's a lot of raking that I do not want to do. So think about how much maintenance are you really in for? Um, also the timing of your maintenance, you know, things like sages, um, they don't benefit from deadheading. So once the flowers have been pollinated and it's gone to seed, um, goldfinches, house finches, other seed eating birds love sage seed heads. Um, consider just leaving those on there for a while so the birds can actually eat those seeds. Uh, and then, you know, we always have to think about firescaping, which is sort of a, a topic unto itself. But um, just being thoughtful about your roof lines and proximity to um, structures and things like that for your plants. So now let's get into um, native plants for birds. And I've kind of arranged some of these lists with regard to the, the major food groups of, of birds. So some of my favorite fruit plants, you have a, a list here and we'll kind of go one by one through them. Toyon, uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with uh, heteromeles, arbutifolia. Um, this is a, a great plant winter fruit, which is pretty awesome. This is one that I've seen uh, wax wings really enjoy in the winter time. Um, but, you know, things like robins and Hermit thrushes are also fans. Uh, good size, it, it, can, it can get kind of like a 20 feet tall by 20 to 25 foot spread. Um, doesn't mind a little bit of shade and uh, it's evergreen, which is kind of nice. This Catalina cherry is, is a top plant and I, I have this as a fruit plant, but um, Doug Tallamy out of the University of Delaware has been doing a lot of work to study the relationship between plants and caterpillars in particular. He's done most of his work on the East Coast, but they've done some surrogate work here in, in California and the, the results kind of track. And the two top genera of plants in North America that they found that are suitable landscape plants um, that attract caterpillars are Quercus, so the oaks, and then Prunus is, I think, number two on the list in terms of 
caterpillar attracting plant. So I have this listed as a fruit plant, but it's also a great insect plant. Um, really beautiful tree. It's got great foliage, um, got great flowers. It's got an interesting um, scent to it. Uh, you know, the fruits can become so abundant and dense that you, you will have a lot of bird droppings and you'll have a lot of uh, cherry pits on the ground and, and half chewed fruits and things like that. So that's what I mean when I talk about messy plants, just, just be aware. I don't think it's a bad thing, but uh, it's something to consider. If you want something a little more compact, the Frangula, Californica, the coffee berry. Um, this is one, you know, thinking about seasonality, this is more the summer and fall fruit. Um, it's really attractive to a lot of insects. Uh, beneficial insects happen to like this plant quite a bit from what I'm told. And there are a lot of cultivars of, of Frangula out there. This is a favorite, the Rogers Red, beautiful, fall foliage, uh, you know, summer fruit that persists into the fall and winter. Uh, it's a vine, which is really nice. This is actually a hybrid between the California grape and like a table grape, um, but it's, it's beautiful. Uh, so not only is it great habitat, uh, it grows pretty well in our region. In the fall, that stunning crimson of the foliage is uh, just really pleasing to the eye. Uh, this is a stalwart, the Rus integrifolia, lemonade berry. Uh, what's nice about it is it's really versatile in the landscape setting. It takes a hard pruning. Uh, we've had a, a Rus hedge in the courtyard of the garden for like 92 years. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, if you live pretty far inland out of the marine layer, consider Rus ovata. That's the sugar bush, close cousin. Love the, the elderberries. So this is kind of a small tree, large shrub. Um, the flowers are attractive. The, the fruits are attractive. They're, this particular elderberry in the fall is one of my favorites to visit in the garden. That's where, you know, I've, I've seen orange crown warbler, Wilson's warbler, um, yellow warbler, uh, black-throated gray warbler, orioles, tanagers, all kind of milling around and hanging out and feeding off of insects and, and persistent fruits. And it's just really useful plant too, which is pretty cool. Moving along to some of our seed plants. This solidago is great. This is great seasonally because this is a late summer bloomer. So it's gonna give you your seeds into the fall and potentially for uh, into the winter. One thing to note, it, it's winter deciduous, so it will have kind of a, a seasonal impact or it, it'll just kind of disappear in the winter time. Um, great for pollinators in addition to the seeds. Love the buckwheats, love buckwheats. So many buckwheats, so beautiful, so many colors. Uh, they're attractive to a lot of butterflies, particularly the blue butterflies, uh, larval host plant for a lot of the blues. Um, you can get, Flower colors anywhere from cream to red to yellow. Uh, many of the inflorescences, when they've been pollinated, the flower parts disappear. And then you have these really rusty um, fruits and seed heads, which are really cool. Um, lots of different varieties to choose from. Great plants, lots of growth forms. Some of them grow from a basal rosette and they have these really exerted inflorescences. Some of them make nice, tight little shrubs. Some of them have a more sprawling form, a uh, really versatile ge genus, get you an areogonum um, for the birds and the insects. Love the deer grass, the Muhlenbergia rigens. This is one that I think is great for rhythm. Uh, you plant them in a mass and you get all these hummocky clumps that have nice little nooks and crannies and hiding hidey holes. Gotta love the, the sages, they're aromatic, they're attractive, they have beautiful flowers. Um, this is a top plant for native bees. You know, we have uh, over 1,500 species of native bee in California, and it's on the sages in particular that I've, I've seen really great bee diversity. They love those bilaterally symmetrical flowers, uh, you know, BC in the ultraviolet and the, the higher frequency end of the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, they have these really attractive flowers. 
to bees. Um, can't, can't say enough good things about sages. Love the sages. If you've got space, consider a conifer. Um, great structure. A mature conifer is, is just a wonderful thing in the landscape. Uh, of course, the, the cones have the potential to attract a, a wide variety of birds, uh, including some specialty birds, depending on, on where you live. Um, but they, they can be very sappy and uh, the needles can drop and, and create sort of a slipping hazard. Uh, and then the cones can be proliferous, prolific, uh, prolific in some years, and you get lots and lots of cones on the ground. So just ask yourself, am I ready for a conifer? Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Encelia californica, the bush sunflower, beautiful uh, plant. You see the insects love it as well. They're short-lived. Don't expect it to, to stick around for more than you know five to seven years. So think about um, as a successional plant, like I said, you know, if you've got mature canopy and you're planning, um, you, you're going to put a Catalina cherry in the ground, you know, it's going to be 15 years before it really grows up. What are, how are you designing your garden around that tree that's going to grow and successionally and do you need to fill some space while a tree grows in, you maybe use a bush sunflower uh, as sort of a space filler, you know, it's not gonna live long. Um, they do reseed a little bit um, so you can get, you know, future generations, uh, but also know that a lot of California native plants are drought deciduous, right? We were talking about evapotranspiration. That's a major limiting factor for plants. So uh, in our Mediterranean climate, when we have our, our guaranteed drought every year, evapotranspiration load is really high on plants when there hasn't been a water input from May all the way to October. Uh, you know, those hot days in September, uh, plants can be photosynthesizing, letting a little bit of water vapor out of their leaves, using that pressure differential to suck water up from the soil. But what if there's no water in the soil? You get something called xylem cavitation. It's like a, a straw if you put your finger on the end of one of those little plastic straws. I know you, you can't find those too much anymore, which is a good thing, but if you suck on it, it crumples, it cavitates. That's what happens to the plant. So to avoid this, some plants have evolved this drought deciduousness. They lose their leaves in the summertime, thereby losing that evapotranspirative effect and allowing them to conserve water and resources until they're more readily available when the, re the leaves will reform, uh, redevelop in the cooler months. So bush sunflower does this. Let's talk about nectar plants specifically for the hummingbirds and to some degree, you know, things like orioles and some of the other tropical birds. Um, love the California fuchsia. Uh, this is a great hummingbird plant and it gives us that later season bloom, which is really nice. Uh, it tends to be low growing, it can be creeping, it, you can kind of prune it into a sort of a tight little um, ball of goodness, if you like, but it can also be kind of a rangy, spready plant that takes up some space, which is kind of cool. Uh, not necessarily part of the California floristic province, but uh, native to the Sonoran Desert, Chilopsis. This is sort of our native equivalent of the Hakaranda, same family, Bignoniaceae. You see that flower structure is very similar. Um, great plant for nectar, really lovely plants, really sculptural, great little street trees. Uh, gotta love the Dudleyas, extremely diverse genus. There's something like 63 species of Dudleya in, in California and Baja. Um, really cool plants. And uh, they have these great inflorescences, nice succulents. So their response, they're in the Crassulaceae family. Um, they, they have a different photosynthetic pathway. They do crassulation, crassulaic acid metabolism. So um, they, they kind of have these little batteries where they'll store the sun's energy and they'll convert it to this acid. And then at night, they'll open their stomati and process uh, and finish the rest of photosynthesis. So kind of a cool adaptation. Uh, hummingbird sage in particular, Salvia staphysia. This is a great one for hummingbirds. Love the penstemons. This is also a great one for native bees. 
some of the larger bodied bees in particular uh, can be self seeding. They're short lived. They're small little plants. So this is one where, you know, one pen stem in the ground isn't going to do a whole lot for you. Um, this is one that you're going to want to mass both visually. So you can, you and whoever's looking at the space that you're designing say, oh, look at, look at those pen stamens. They don't get lost in the landscape, but also so that, that the insects and the birds are like, yeah, that's a little, that's a little patch of some goodness. Uh, insects, we've talked a lot about insects. A lot of these plants sort of double as good insect plants, but here are a few top notch insect plants. Like I said, the oaks, um, California is a center for diversity uh, for the oaks, uh, Mexico even more so, but we have, I don't know, 15, 18, 20 species of oak in California. Um, you know, if, uh, if you don't have space for a big oak tree, consider a, a scrub oak like Quercus berberdifolia. Cowdy bush, this is a great one. The baccarus, this is a dioecious plant, two houses. So there's a pollen bearing individual and there's a fruit bearing individual. So just, just be aware, which, which are you after? What are you, um, what are you installing? Are you installing one that has pollen or one that creates fruits? Um, and then there are several um, cultivars. There's the Pigeon Point from Pigeon Point, San Mateo Coast, really windy maritime conditions. So very low growing, uh, spreading like you see in that upper photo. There's also one Centennial that's upright, but it's much more compact. Uh, Ceanothus, I love the big pod Ceanothus, but there are tons, I mean, Ceanothus is another huge genus. So look at what your local Ceanothus are. Um, think about installing some, some local Ceanothus uh, in your site, LA, the dominant may not be Megacarpus, it may be more like Cuneatus or Thrissifolius or Griseus or something like that. So just uh, look into what your local Ceanothus are. This is one of my personal favorites, the mountain mahogany, member of the rose family, uh, vigorous. It grows really nicely. So this can be a great screening plant. If you mass it, it grows very vertically and it can create a screen. Uh, it's got these really beautiful fruits. Uh, and it's also the host plant for a number of caterpillars, in particular, the hair streaks really like mountain mahogany. Now, just um, kind of overall top performers, habitat plants that, that I, I think, you know, are just kind of winners in general for creating any kind of habitat. We already talked about oaks. They're beautiful and incredible and precious. Um, they grow slowly and they get very large in many cases. Uh, and they can be a little finicky. Coast live oaks in particular um, do not want summer water. Uh, they will root rot if you water them in the summertime. So uh, there are certain kind of care um, considerations with, with the oaks, but get you an oak if you can. Um, Artemisia californica, California sagebrush. I imagine many of you are familiar with this plant. This is another drought deciduous one. Um, there's a, a cool cultivar that the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden introduced called Canyon Gray. You see it in the photo on the left. It's a very hummocky, mounding, creeping form, which is really nice. Good habitat. Love an atroplex. Um, my, my plant materials professor in grad school called uh, quail bush atroplex lentiformis instant habitat. Um, insects love it. It's, it grows big and massive. It's got fruits that birds like, lots of space to hide in, um, doesn't require a lot of water, tons of adaptations for drought. Uh, really cool, really cool plant. Love you, Atroplex. The uh, members of Ribes, uh, great genus, uh, gooseberries and currants, lots of species to choose from. Um, really just lovely plants, great plant materials from a design standpoint, really cool flowers and good habitat. Like I said earlier, uh, I love a willow and this, this is uh, exigua, the salix exigua, uh, I recommend for like a, a residential setting because they tend to stay a little smaller, a little more compact. This is a plant that's great 
If you have um, a rain garden or a water retention basin or gray water return or something like that, um, just a really cool, really cool plant, uh, tons of insects. And if you get it nice and dense, I, I can almost guarantee you'll get lots of birds. So those are my, my recommendations for plants. Here are some resources for you to consider. I particularly recommend the Cowscape website. It's got great information about plant ranges. It's got information about nursery availability of plants. It'll tell you when the plant blooms. It'll give you care instructions. It'll give you propagation information. Um, highly recommended. And then a couple books if you're old school and you want something paper in the hand uh, to look at. And just one note, in a month, we will have a brand new website. And we are redesigning our website to have lots of great uh, California native plant horticulture resources. So check us out in June because this website is going to be awesome. I definitely um, presented this talk, but this isn't this isn't my knowledge. This isn't my information. A lot of people contributed a lot uh, of knowledge and imagery and um, just feedback in order to, to make this happen. So thanks to them. And thanks to you. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I hope there was some, some good little nuggets of information in there for you. And uh, be happy to have a chat at this point. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. It's uh, really timely for me personally. We're about a third through uh, redoing some of our yards around us. So um, is well, well timed information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Um, yeah let's, let's see if we have any questions in the yeah. Q&A or the chat. Usually we like people putting them in Q&A. But chat is fine too. Um, Scott, are you going to can you send us a summary of you mentioned something about summary of the plants that you talked about tonight oh i can i can share these slides if you like okay that actually might be good also if you wouldn't mind sending them over to frank and then we can um do some editing to go on to our web page or excuse me our webinar page that'd be cool you got it yep yeah, because there's a cool. lot of really good information there that people might want to use as a reference. And um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, know, I learned a lot, you know, got some good ideas. Yeah. So what, tell us about grapes. We don't have any grapes. So I, it's not something I really, I guess they're native to California. What kind of habitat requirements do they need and can they tolerate shade and yeah, we, we use them pretty effectively throughout the, the garden in a variety of, of settings. They'll grow in a, you know, the cut wine barrel sort of thing. Um, you know, they you know, think about where the, the vineyards, um, a professor once told me in Europe, you know, they, they overgrazed and things, um, the, the soil wasn't fertile and they decided, what do we do here? Let's grow grapes. Uh, and so they, they tolerate a variety of soil conditions um, they can take full sun. They can take a little bit of shade. Uh, think about Grapevine Canyon. That, that's why Grapevine Canyon, that's why the grapevine is named the grapevine, because mm -hmm. those canyons, all of those plants, all those trees were just covered. They were, they were like um, strangler figs in the tropics, you know, the way they just drape over these plants. So um, they, they do like water, um, but the, you can, you, with the cultivars that are out there right now, they can get by. They're pretty tough. Uh, little plants. And I was kind of surprised to hear you talk about conifers, um, especially with um, drought hitting us and all that. It, aren't conifers pretty high water need plants? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think, you know, the one of the biggest, I'm mean, certainly like pinon pines are, are adapted to extremely arid environments. So no, I think they can... Are. You can choose, you know, pretty pretty well suited plants. I think the main thing is that they they get really messy, and that's one of the reasons we don't see them in in landscapes a lot. But a, a well placed uh, pinon pine, I think, can be just a beautiful addition to the landscape. 
Good I see a question here about uh, oaks not wanting summer water. Yeah. Coast live oaks in particular, because we live in a Mediterranean climate, these plants are adapted to an annual drought every year uh, from, you know, right around now until October. And uh, as such, they, they don't really tolerate their feet being wet in the summer. So if you're planting or cultivating coast live oaks, shut off the water in the summer because they're really susceptible to root rot. Uh, if they get a lot of summer water. Are there other plants like that that are really adverse to getting water in the summer? A lot of our native plants are, you know, they'll tolerate some summer water, but generally, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> once you establish native plants, you, you don't really, especially if they're from your local region, you don't really need to give a lot of supplemental water in the summertime. Cool. We have another question. Another question by Julie. So on eruption, I guess you could say a prickly poppy that we're all over. It's one little section of the Angels Cross Highway. I've never seen it like that before, but it was hundreds of plants all blooming. Do you hmm. know why that is, or are they fire followers? Yeah, I would I would probably guess um, there's there's some sort of disturbance that that's happened and the, the conditions were right, and that's part of the, the plant strategy. I don't know a ton about the life history of those fire following a lot of members of the poppy family are are good fire followers and so likely what happened is uh, a seed bank was built up and those seeds were waiting for the the right conditions whatever the disturbance regime is that the plant prefers those conditions occurred and then you know that that allowed for and probably uh, it also timed up really nicely with a favorable precipitation year um, we know we learned on Tohon Ranch, there was a lot of work done in the grasslands and the, the timing and the intensity of the precipitation had a major impact on individual plant populations. Interesting. Yeah. And we've had some, a couple of really bad fires here in the last five, six years. So mm -hmm. lots of lazuli buntings. Mm, not bad. One consolation prize. Yes. One. And I think we're running out of questions. I have a question about flowering plants like um, columbines and mm -hmm. windies and other things like that. Are those, what do you what do you think about those? Because it seems the uh, hummingbirds seem to like those a lot. Great nectar plants. Yeah, I think that just goes back to your goals. You know, what are you what are you trying to attract? What are what are the birds that you really want in your in your yard or the insects? What's the wildlife? Um, just kind of an interesting anecdote about columbines. There's a, a study that um, our director of conservation and research has shared with me. Variety of species of columbines, you know how they have those nectaries, those spurs going up that gives them that really distinctive shape. The, the length of the nectary is directly correlated with the length of the tongue of the moths that pollinate them uh, <laughs> for a variety of Western columbine species. And so that just illustrates that tight relationship between yeah. insects and plants that's incredible i always i always love hearing about uh things like that are there indicators species of insects you should be thinking about depending on where you live like for us we live in the chaparral we're thinking about for indicated birds we think of buick's wrens and spotted towhees and you know things like that scrub jays other things are there insects that are indicators that you can know you're, you're mm -hmm. going in the right direction? Uh, I've, I've been using the bees, thinking about, you know, huh? bumblebees and native bees. Um, I, I think butterfly diversity is another one. Uh, if you are able to, to go out at night and uh, get a light on a sheet and look at your moths, I think that's another good indicator. Um, yeah, I, I don't know specifically, I don't, that's something that we're actually starting to do is more systematically study the relationship between converting yards to native plants and exactly what insects are getting attracted and how, how our ecosystem processes kind of unfolding after the, the installation of the plant. So probably in the coming years, we will um, know a little bit more, but you might want to check out Doug Tallamy. Um, he's, uh, he, he wrote Bringing Nature Home, I think, and I think this most recent one is Our Best Hope or something like that. He's done a lot of research uh, on the East Coast 
about the relationship between insects and plants. He's an entomologist. He talks a lot about um, keystone plants to plant. So like the, the Quercus and the Prunus as being um, attractive to a wide variety of insects, but he might also have some information specifically about insects that tell you that you're on the right track. Um, I see a question here about Carolina cherry tree. Yeah. Uh, I don't know much about that, that species. You know, if it's in the genus Prunus, probably. Uh, I think a lot of caterpillars in particular, um, you know, they, they have generic hosts. So if it's within the genus, it could work. Um, but I, I think, yeah, Scott, let's repeat the question because not everyone can yeah. see it. Would the Carolina oh, cherry tree be similar and, and as advantageous as Catalina cherry? That's the question. And yeah, I think the answer Catalina. is yeah, probably. Um, I would, I would, uh, prefer to use the native plant myself and, and I would think that it, um, probably has more local benefit to, to the ecology in your area. However, that being said, if you already have a mature yeah. Carolina cherry tree <laughs> in your yard, you know, that's, that's like the Chinese proverb, right? Like the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago and the next <laughs> best time is today. So, you know, that's, that's, that's where we have to make these decisions and their judgment calls. If, if you have high quality habitat for some reason or another, you, you probably want to maintain it. It reminds me when I first moved to New Mexico, back to New Mexico after Tejon, um, they introduce a lot of the tamarisk beetles out there. Oh. Um, and so it's a biocontrol. There are these beetles that eat tamarisk and they, they kill it. They do a really good job, but they release them throughout Southern New Mexico and they did their job extremely well. Uh -oh. But there was no plan for succession. <laughs> and so what happened is you had these skeletonized tamarisk forests, which now had zero habitat value. And even, even the few willow flycatchers that were nesting in the extant tamarisk no longer had nesting habitat. And so that's where these judgment calls come in. You might want to say, I just want to rip this out and put in all natives. But if there's a habitat value already in place, you should really consider that. And that's why that due diligence in planning is so important. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And going back to the cherry question uh, one to go, you know, so much of um, the LA suburbs and uh, valleys and all that um, were were planted by um, by people who from the uh, by plant excuse me planted by East Coast uh, plants, and so you have a Carolina cherry instead of a native cherry and things mm -hmm. like that. And yeah, you're right. It you have to make that judgment call. Yeah, there's another question. Uh, what are, Carol asks, what are your thoughts about sycamore trees? I love sycamore trees, um, particularly in floodplains. Um, you know, they, they do require a fair amount of water. They can be a little bit tricky because there are so many uh, London plane trees out there, closely related, same genus, but not the native species, not quite as beneficial. It's easy in the nursery trade to get plants that are hybridized. So it, you're not as likely to get a straight native Platinus racemosa, which just kind of a, a cool little fact, the uh, type locality for uh, Western Sycamore uh, is Mission Canyon, where the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is. So that's, that's ah. where <laughs> Western Sycamore was first collected and described as, as a unique taxon. I think that's just kind of a cool little factoid <laughs> about Mission Canyon. But I think they're great trees. They can be great street trees. You got to have a lot of space for them, and and they're pretty thirsty. Yeah, it worries me. We have a uh, house uh, block away that has some beautiful old sycamores on it, and uh, with the drought restrictions coming on, we'll we'll see how things survive. Well, if they're if they're old, they may have tapped into some sort of groundwater source, which is the one the one nice thing. I'd be I'd be particularly worried about the sort of teenage ones that may not have established their roots so much, uh, and then dramatically cutting back water. They they're just sort of left uh, yeah. high and dry. Good point. Good point. Good point. Um, I think that uh, speaking of getting high and dry, I think we're about dry on questions. 
Uh, well, Scott, thank you very much for presenting our webinar tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, it's always good to have a really good plant presentation. It really gets us homeowners thinking and even us uh, apartment dwellers thinking about what little habitat areas we can create on our balconies and all that. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. My thank pleasure. You. Yeah. Single thank hummingbird you. sage can do a lot. A single Dudleya can do a lot if you're, if you're patio gardening in a container and they're beautiful plants. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much. Again, I just want to remind everyone, we have a pelagic trip set for this Saturday. It's leaving out of Marine Del Rey. We have a few spots left on that pelagic trip. If you would like to attend, please go to our website at laburgers.org and click on the events tab and I'll give you all the information you need to know. Anything else, Mark, that uh, no, I'm missing? Sounds, sounds great. Yeah, mm. Sounds good. Go ahead, Scott. I have one more thing. I just want to, Susan, um, you should coordinate the student birders. Let's get a trip up to the garden. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, sounds like fun. Right. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. They'd like it. All right, let me know. All right, I'll do yeah. it. Sounds great. And Thank with you. that, we will see everyone next month when we have some great webinars coming up. And uh, in the meantime, take care. Happy birding. Enjoy migration. And we'll see you next month. Take care. Thanks, Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Bye.